Welcome to season two of Gray Maybe, a limited series podcast and social experiment based on this season's topic, the body. My name is Jillian Schmitz. I'm a professional dancer, actor, teacher, author, artist, and cat lover. Through my own personal journey of recovery, I've found that things aren't just black or white, or as simple as yes or no. For me, in my recovery, there has been mostly gray area and a lot of maybes. In most of my stories, you can find the gray maybe. I will be sharing my own process through personal stories, interviews, and hopefully stories from listeners in an effort to help lessen the stigma and shame of disordered eating, eating disorders, and body image. If you'd like to share your story of ED recovery on this podcast, anonymous or otherwise, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using to catch future episodes of Gray Maybe. A note before we begin. The topic of disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and other behavior related to the body may not be difficult for me to share anymore, but it wasn't always this way. I recognize and anticipate the possibility of judgment or disbelief about my experiences, ranging from my own family members to strangers, in addition to the potentiality of losing certain opportunities for publicizing my own experiences. My stories and the stories of others on this podcast are told through the lens of our own experience. The revelation of our process is ours to tell. If you disagree with the views or stories on this podcast, know that we are not speaking on anything other than our own experiences and viewpoints. Take what you like and leave the rest. Nothing expressed or mentioned in this podcast is an endorsement or is meant to be taken as suggestion or advice. It is strictly the sharing of our own experiences and recovery. Any feelings this podcast activates in the listener is for the listener to process and recover from. Any criticism you have based on these experiences and choices are yours, and they are not anyone else's burden to carry. Trigger warning. Eating disorders, disordered eating, fat phobia, body dysmorphia, depression, anxiety. Welcome back, everyone, to Gray Maybe. This season, in addition to sharing my own stories, I've done mostly conversational interviews with people who have been courageous enough to share their experiences and those who I think can help surrounding this topic. I also wanted to have the flexibility of adding episodes upon reflection or new experience. So today's episode is about a realization I had since starting this season of the podcast that I wanted to share with you. I was taking a shower and realized that although it's one of the few places I can't body check with a reflection, I still find a way by relying on what my eyes can gather. Glancing down and sizing up body parts from a stark and unforgiving angle, I compulsively contemplate the width of my hips and thighs and how I feel in my body. Someone once said in recovery that you can't feel fat because fat isn't a feeling, just like I can't feel having brown eyes. So what is the feeling then? What is the feeling when I feel like I'm expanding past the appropriate space I think my body should be occupying? I feel bigger, larger, I feel bloated. I feel the flesh on my bones move and ricochet more than I think it should or at all. I feel like crawling out of my skin. I feel out of control. I feel anxious. What do I feel anxious about? Before I can actually figure out what I'm specifically anxious about, because it could be anything really, ding, just like a phone timed reminder, instantly a notification pops up in my head. It's the new year, time to go on a diet and turn this around. Whatever I did over the holidays, I could rectify. Whatever I was last year, I could be better this year. Whatever I think I need to do to prepare myself for this new year. 
new year, and I can reinvent myself and be the best ever body, and therefore me. Whatever this feeling is that I can't identify, I think I know the cure. I've heard in the rooms of recovery that I'm not responsible for my first thought. I am, however, responsible for my second thought and first action. Just as quickly as the New Year's diet reminder popped up, my second thought arrived. That would be so nice, wouldn't it? That would feel so good to be in control of something. My mind chuckled as I washed my hair and said to myself, as if I were speaking to another being in the bathroom with me, we're not doing that anymore. We're trying to accept this body as is. We. We are. We are not doing that anymore. Not me, not I. We. You and I. My eating disorder and me. I've been talking to us like this for a while now, but only in this moment did I realize it. I've been in active recovery for at least five years. Sure, I've been in dysfunction technically much more of my life than not, but getting recovery or better or sober or whatever you want to call it, my eating disorder is still with me. It still has a seat at the table, even if it has been stripped of all of its committee assignments. It mostly hangs around a ghost version of what it used to be, trying to offer redundant suggestions that I know now don't serve me. Although here and there, its advice is enticing and often still very seductive. Old habits die hard. Before recovery, I didn't see a difference between my eating disorder and myself. When I first started going to therapy, they asked me to identify the voice. Some people call it the eating disorder voice or the ED voice or the voice of Ed, or simply the disease. I've used all of them interchangeably over time. Before recovery, the idea that this thing could be separate from me wasn't real. This was part of me. It was who I was. It felt like part of my personality. The thoughts in my head telling me to do things that I was doing was in my own voice. The same voice that told me to remember to pick up deodorant and toothpaste at Target after teaching also told me not to eat, even when I was starving. Not all crazy people hear voices. They hear their own voice being crazy. I think I've shared this before, but it's worth repeating. Early in my recovery, when I started to recognize that my eating disorder had a voice and that the voice sounded exactly like my own, I had to decipher who was driving the bus of my thoughts and actions. Once I was able to separate that damaging voice from my own, my eating disorder didn't go away. It continued to lurk. And although we were no longer enmeshed, it still felt like we were on the same team. Every action I took towards a recovery win felt like a loss to me and my eating disorder. Losing control felt like losing the battle. For example, bread. Eating bread as a normal thing felt like a loss because it was something I'd conditioned myself to think was not only something that would cause me to gain weight, but also that it was toxic to my digestion because I had convinced myself I was allergic to it. This ended up not being true. However, there was absolutely no convincing me otherwise at this point in time. I also craved and desired bread 24-7. Sometimes these fights between recovery and me and my disorder were too close to call, and sometimes we all lost. When I would go to OA meetings, Overeaters Anonymous, and listen to people share who had some recovery, they would talk about accepting their bodies, being kind to their bodies, liking their bodies, even loving their bodies. I applauded them, but quickly heard my eating disorder say in my own voice, That's great for them, but they're not you. They don't have the career you have. They don't have to look a certain way. They don't have to control themselves to have a livelihood. They don't get it. You're not the same. That's great for them. But you, me, we need to keep this body in control or else everything we've worked for will fall apart. We cannot be weak. We cannot lose control. How will we be appealing? How will we be liked? How will we be loved?
How could I love something that felt like I had to fight with day in and day out to be what I thought it needed to be just to simply survive? When I look back at images or videos of career accomplishments and memories, I can remember how I felt about myself in that moment, how self-conscious I was at the costume fitting for that job while trying to maintain an easy-to-work-with professional attitude, even though I was dying of self-hatred inside, how long it took me to get ready or decide on what I was wearing, or how much better everything would be and how calm I would feel if I could just fix it be a little thinner, my body a little different, my nose a little smaller, or straight. The constant paranoia that someone would find out what my body really looked like. I had been desperately and carefully curating clothing and constantly posing to try and portray the body type I wanted, thinking I was successful in hiding the real me. Every photo I took, I thought I was the most unattractive I'd ever been only to look back at the same photo in the future and yearn to look more like I did back then. When I look back on these images, I don't remember these moments. I only remember how much I hated myself in these moments. Much like my depression is often at a low-level hum in the background of my life, my eating disorder still lingers like an annoying kid sister you can't get rid of. One who knows how to push all of your buttons and repeat phrases you absolutely cannot stand. These days, my eating disorder has been demoted to back of the bus passenger only. But that doesn't stop it from taking any opportunity when I'm distracted or overwhelmed to jump behind the wheel. Simple things like trying on clothes, costume fittings, selfies, class videos, live footage, yoga pants, stressful life events, feeling out of control, general anxiety, heartbreak, the news, My eating disorder is happy to grab the wheel and start driving off-road with orders, observations, actions, and verbal lashings. Sometimes, I don't recognize my hijacked voice right away. I was distracted, after all. And then, because I've practiced over and over, I pause, and I grab the wheel from my eating disorder, and I instruct it to go sit quietly at the back of the bus while I figure this out for us. I remind my eating disorder I don't need their help anymore. I tell them they're allowed to exist, but they cannot be in charge. I'm trying to get to the place where I can love my body, but I find that it's difficult for me, and forcing it only leads to feeling shame. So, I aim often for tolerance. Tolerance of my body and tolerance of my eating disorder. I'm going to keep trying, though. Much like a child misbehaving, in their ill-equipped way to get love and attention. My eating disorder and the child in me both need and deserve so much forgiveness, grace, care, and love. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you were able to find something relatable in today's episode. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, this is also a social experiment to see if in telling my story, I can embolden listeners to share their stories. If you'd like me to read your recovery story on this topic, anonymous or otherwise, on the podcast, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com, G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who helped make this Gray Maybe podcast happen. Producer and editor, Roderick Barge. Cover photo by Jose Perez. Music licensed by Pixabay. Special counsel, Jada Ellingham and Roderick Barge. Special shout out to supporter, Patty Olgan. If you'd like to support this podcast, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now.